The Battle of Khe San was conducted in the Khe San area of northwestern Quang Tri Province, Republic of Vietnam, during the Vietnam War. The main U.S. forces defending Khe San Combat Base were two regiments of the United States Marine Corps supported by elements from the United States Army and the United States Air Force, as well as a small number of Army of the Republic of Vietnam troops. These were pitted against two to three divisional size elements of the North Vietnamese People's Army of Vietnam. The U.S. command in Saigon initially believed that combat operations around KSCB during 1967 were part of a series of minor Pavan offensives in the border regions. That appraisal was later altered when the Pavan was found to be moving major forces into the area. In response, U.S. forces were built up before the Pavan isolated the Marine base. Once the base came under siege, a series of actions was fought over a period of five months. During this time, KSCB and the hilltop outposts around it were subjected to constant paven artillery, mortar, and rocket attacks, and several infantry assaults. To support the Marine base, a massive aerial bombardment campaign was launched by the USAF. Over 100,000 tons of bombs were dropped by U.S. aircraft and over 158,000 artillery rounds were fired in defense of the base. Throughout the campaign, U.S. forces used the latest technology to locate Paven forces for targeting. Additionally, the logistical effort required to support the base once it was isolated demanded the implementation of other tactical innovations to keep the Marines supplied. In March 1968, an overland relief expedition was launched by a combined Marine Army slash ARVN task force that eventually broke through to the Marines at Khe San. American commanders considered the defense of Khe San a success, but shortly after the siege was lifted, the decision was made to dismantle the base rather than risk similar battles in the future. On the 19th of June 1968, the evacuation and destruction of KSCB began. Amid heavy shelling, the Marines attempted to salvage what they could before destroying what remained as they were evacuated. Minor attacks continued before the base was officially closed on 5 July. Marines remained around Hill 689, though, and fighting in the vicinity continued until 11 July until they were finally withdrawn, bringing the battle to a close. In the aftermath, the North Vietnamese proclaimed a victory at Khe San, while U.S. forces claimed that they had withdrawn, as the base was no longer required. Historians have observed that the Battle of Khe San may have distracted American and South Vietnamese attention from the buildup of Viet Cong forces in the South before the early 1968 Tet Offensive. Nevertheless, the U.S. commander during the battle, General William Westmoreland, maintained that the true intention of Tet was to distract forces from Khe San. Chapter 1 Prelude. The village of Khe San was the seat of government of Hong Hoa District, an area of brew mountain yard villages and coffee plantations about seven miles from the Laotian frontier on Route 9, the northernmost transverse road in South Vietnam. The badly deteriorated Route 9 ran from the coastal region through the western highlands and crossed the border into Laos. The origin of the combat base lay in the construction by U.S. Army Special Forces of an airfield in August 1962 outside the village at an old French fort. The camp then became a Special Forces outpost of the civilian irregular defense groups, which were to keep watch on paven infiltration along the border and to protect the local population. James Marino wrote that in 1964, General William Westmoreland, the U.S. commander in Vietnam, had determined, Khe San could serve as a patrol base blocking enemy infiltration from Laos, a base for operations to harass the enemy in Laos, an airstrip for reconnaissance to survey the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a western anchor for the defenses south of the DMZ, and an eventual jumping-off point for ground operations to cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail. In November 1964, the special forces moved their camp to the Zum Cham Plateau, the future site of Khe San combat base. In the winter of 1964, Khe San became the location of a launch site for the Highly Classified Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, Studies and Observations Group. The site was first established near the village and later moved, to the French fort. From there, 
reconnaissance teams were launched into Laos to explore and gather intelligence on the Pavan logistical system known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail, also known as Truong Sun Strategic Supply Route to the North Vietnamese soldiers. Marino stated that by 1966, Westmoreland had begun to consider Khe San as part of a larger strategy. With a view to gain the eventual approval for an advance through Laos to interdict the Ho Chi Minh Trail, he determined that it was absolutely essential to hold the base. He gave the order for U.S. Marines to take up positions around Khe San. Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, then began planning for incursion into Laos, and in October, the construction of an airfield at Khe San was completed. The plateau camp was permanently manned by the U.S. Marines in 1967, when they established an outpost next to the airstrip. This base was to serve as the western anchor of Marine Corps forces, which had tactical responsibility for the five northernmost provinces of South Vietnam known as I Corps. The Marines' defensive system stretched below the demilitarized zone from the coast, along Route 9, to Khe San. In 1966, the regular Special Forces troops had moved off the plateau and built a smaller camp down Route 9 at Lang Ve, about half the distance to the Laotian border. Chapter 2 Background Chapter 2 Section 1 Border Battles During the second half of 1967, the North Vietnamese instigated a series of actions in the border regions of South Vietnam. All of the attacks were conducted by regimental size Pavan slash VC units, but unlike most of the previous usual hit and run tactics, they were sustained and bloody affairs. In early October, the Pavan had intensified battalion sized ground probes and sustained artillery fire against Contian, a hilltop stronghold in the center of the Marines' defensive line south of the DMZ, in northern Quang Tri province. Mortar rounds, artillery shells, and 122mm rockets fell randomly, but incessantly upon the base. The September bombardments ranged from 100 to 150 rounds per day, with a maximum on 25 September of 1,190 rounds. Westmoreland responded by launching Operation Neutralize, an aerial and naval bombardment campaign designed to break the siege. For seven weeks, American aircraft dropped from 35,000 to 40,000 tons of bombs in nearly 4,000 airstrikes. On 27 October, a Pavan regiment attacked an army of the Republic of Vietnam Battalion at Song Bi, capital of Phuc Long Province. The Pavan fought for several days, took casualties, and fell back. Two days later, the Pavan 273rd Regiment attacked a special forces camp near the border town of Lork Ninh, in Binh Long Province. Troops of the U.S. 1st Infantry Division were able to respond quickly. After a 10-day battle, the attackers were pushed back into Cambodia. At least 852 Pavan soldiers were killed during the action, as opposed to 50 American and South Vietnamese. The heaviest action took place near Dak Tu in the central highlands province of Con Tum. The presence of the Pavan 1st Division prompted a 22-day battle there and had some of the most intense close quarters fighting of the entire conflict. U.S. intelligence estimated between 1,200 and 1,600 Pavan troops were killed, and 362 members of the U.S. 4th Infantry Division, the 173rd Airborne Brigade, and ARVN Airborne Elements were killed in action but three of the four battalions of the 4th Infantry and the entire 173rd were rendered combat ineffective during the battle. American intelligence analysts were quite baffled by the series of enemy actions. No logic was apparent to them behind the sustained pavan slash vc offensives other than to inflict casualties on the Allied forces. That was accomplished, but the casualties absorbed by the North Vietnamese seemed to negate any direct gains they might have obtained. The border battles, however, had two significant consequences, which were unappreciated at the time. They fixed the attention of the American command on the border regions, and they drew American and ARVN forces away from the coastal lowlands and cities in preparation for the Tet Offensive. Chapter 2 Section 2 – Hill Fights Things remained quiet in the Khe San area through 1966. Even so, 
Westmoreland insisted for it not only to be occupied by the Marines but also for it to be reinforced. He was vociferously opposed by General Louis W. Walt, the Marine commander of I Corps, who argued heatedly that the real target of the American effort should be the pacification and protection of the population, not chasing the Paven slash VC in the hinterlands. Westmoreland won out, however, and the 1st Battalion, 3rd Marine Regiment was dispatched to occupy the camp and airstrip on 29 September. By late January 1967, the one-third returned to Japan and was relieved by Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. A single company replaced an entire battalion. On 24 April 1967, a patrol from Bravo Company became engaged with a Paven force of an unknown size north of Hill 861. That action prematurely triggered a Paven offensive aimed at taking Kaysan. The Paven forces were in the process of gaining elevated terrain before it launched of the main attack. The 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 3rd Marine Regiment, under the command of Colonel John P. Lanigan, reinforced KSCB, and were given the task of pushing the Paven off of hills 861, 881 north, and 881 south. Paven forces were driven out of the area around K. San after suffering 940 casualties. The Marines suffered 155 killed in action and 425 wounded, dot to prevent Paven observation of the main base at the airfield and their possible use as fire bases, the hills of the surrounding Kaysan Valley had to be continuously occupied and defended by separate marine elements. In the wake of the hill fights, a lull in Paven activity occurred around Kaysan. By the end of May, Marine forces were again drawn down from two battalions to one, the 1st Battalion, 26th Marines. Lieutenant General Robert E. Cushman Jr. relieved Walt as commander of 3 MAF in June. On 14 August, Colonel David E. Loans took over as commander of the 26th Marine Regiment. Sporadic actions were taken in the vicinity during the late summer and early fall, the most serious of which was the ambush of a supply convoy on Route 9. That proved to be the last overland attempt at resupply for K. San until the following March. In December and early January, numerous sightings of Paven troops and activities were made in the K. San area, but the sector remained relatively quiet. Chapter 2 Section 3 Decisions A decision then had to be made by the American High Command to commit more of the limited manpower in I Corps to the defense of Kaysan or to abandon the base. Westmoreland regarded the choice as quite simple. In his memoirs, he listed the reasons for a continued effort Kaysan could serve as a patrol base for blocking enemy infiltration from Laos along Route 9 as a base for SOG operations to harass the enemy in Laos, as an airstrip for reconnaissance planes surveying the Ho Chi Minh Trail, as the western anchor for defenses south of the DMZ, and as an eventual jump-off point for ground operations to cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Not all leading Marine officers, however, had the same opinion. Cushman, the new 3 MAF commander, supported Westmoreland perhaps because he wanted to mend Army-slash-Marine relations after the departure of Walt. Other concerns raised included the assertion that the real danger to I Corps was from a direct threat to Quang Tri City and other urban areas, a defense would be pointless as a threat to infiltration since Paven troops could easily bypass Khe San, the base was too isolated, and the Marines had neither the helicopter resources, the troops, nor the logistical bases for such operations. Additionally, Shaw argued that the weather was another critical factor because the poor visibility and low overcasts attendant the monsoon season made such operations hazardous. Brigadier General Lowell English complained that the defense of the isolated outpost was ludicrous, when you're at Kaysan, you're not really anywhere. You could lose it and you really haven't lost a damn thing. As far as Westmoreland was concerned, however, all that he needed to know was that the Paven had massed large numbers of troops for a set-piece battle. Making the prospect even more enticing was that the base was in an unpopulated area, in which American firepower could be fully employed without civilian casualties. The opportunity to engage and destroy a formerly elusive enemy that was moving toward a fixed position promised a victory of unprecedented proportions. Chapter 3 
Lattel. Chapter 3 Section 1, Attacks on the Perimeter. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 2 First Skirmishes. In early December 1967, the Pavan appointed Major General Tran Kwai Hai as the local commander for the actions around Khe San, with Le Quang Dao as his political commissar. In the coming days, a campaign headquarters was established around Saplit. Two divisions, the 304th and the 325th, were assigned to the operation, the 325th was given responsibility for the area around the north, while the 304th was given responsibility for the southern sector. In attempting to determine Pavan intentions marine intelligence confirmed that, within a period of just over a week, the 325th Division had moved into the vicinity of the base and two more divisions, were within supporting distance. The 324th Division was located in the DMZ area 10 to 15 miles north of Khe San while the 320th Division was within easy reinforcing distance to the northeast. They were supported logistically from the nearby Ho Chi Minh Trail. As a result of this intelligence, KSCB was reinforced on the 22nd of January 1968 by the 1st Battalion, 9th Marine Regiment. According to the official Pavan history, by December 1967 the North Vietnamese had in place, or within supporting distance, the 304th, 320th, 324th and 325th Infantry Divisions, the Independent 270th Infantry Regiment, five artillery regiments, three AAA regiments, four tank companies, one engineer regiment plus one independent engineer battalion, one signal battalion, and a number of local force units. At positions west of Hill 881 south and north of Ker Rock Ridge, across the border in Laos, the Pavan established artillery, rocket, and mortar positions from which to launch attacks by fire on the base and to support its ground operations. The Pavan 130mm and 152mm artillery pieces, and 122mm rockets, had a longer range than the marine artillery support which consisted of 105mm and 155mm howitzers. This range overmatch was used by the Pavan to avoid counter-battery fire. They were assisted in their emplacement efforts by the continuing bad weather of the winter monsoon docked during the rainy night of 2 January 1968, six men dressed in black uniforms, were seen outside the defensive wire of the main base by members of a listening post. After failing to respond to a challenge, they were fired upon and five were killed outright while the sixth, although wounded, escaped. This event prompted Cushman to reinforce loans with the rest of the 2nd Battalion, 26th Marines. This marked the first time that all three battalions of the 26th Marine Regiment operated together in combat since the Battle of Iwo Jima during the Second World War. To cover a defilade near the Rao Kwan River, four companies from 226 were immediately sent out to occupy Hill 558, with another manning Hill 861A. On 20 January, La Than Tun, a Pavan lieutenant from the 325th Division, defected and laid out the plans for an entire series of Pavan attacks. Hills 881 South, 861, and the main base itself would be simultaneously attacked that same evening. At 030 on 21 January, Hill 861 was attacked by about 300 Pavan troops, the Marines, however, were prepared. The Pavan infantry, though bracketed by artillery fire, still managed to penetrate the perimeter of the defenses and were only driven back after severe close quarters combat. The main base was then subjected to an intense mortar and rocket barrage. Hundreds of mortar rounds and 122mm rockets slammed into the base, leveling most of the above ground structures. One of the first enemy shells set off an explosion in the main ammunition dump. Many of the artillery and mortar rounds stored in the dump were thrown into the air and detonated on impact within the base. Soon after, another shell hit a cache of tear gas, which saturated the entire area. The fighting and shelling on 21 January resulted in 14 Marines killed and 43 wounded. Hours after the bombardment ceased, the base was still in danger. 
At around 10 o'clock, the fire ignited a large quantity of explosives, rocking the base with another series of detonations. At the same time as the artillery bombardment at KSCB, an attack was launched against Kaesan village, seat of Honghoa district. The village, three kilometers south of the base, was defended by 160 local Brew troops, plus 15 American advisors. At dawn on 21 January, it was attacked by a roughly 300-strong Paven battalion. A platoon from Company D, 126 Marines was sent from the base but was withdrawn in the face of the superior Paven forces. Reinforcements from the ARVN 256th Regional Force Company were dispatched aboard nine UH-1 helicopters of the 282nd Assault Helicopter Company, but they were landed near the abandoned French fort-slash-former FOB-3 which was occupied by the Paven who killed many of the RF troops and four Americans, including Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Simo the deputy advisor for Quang Tri Province and forcing the remaining helicopters to abandon the mission. On the morning of the 22nd of January loans decided to evacuate the remaining forces in the village with most of the Americans evacuated by helicopter while two advisors led the surviving local forces overland to the combat base. To eliminate any threat to their flank, the Paven attacked Laotian Battalion BV-33, located at Ban Hoa Sein, on Route 9 in Laos. The battalion was assaulted on the night of 23 January by three Paven battalions supported by seven tanks. The Laotians were overrun, and many fled to the special forces camp at Lang Ve. The Battle of Ban Hoa Sein, not the attack three weeks later at Lang Ve, marked the first time that the Paven had committed an armored unit to battle. Paven artillery fell on the main base for the first time on 21 January. Several rounds also landed on Hill 881. Due to the arrival of the 304th Division, KSCB was further reinforced by the 1st Battalion, 9th Marine Regiment on the 22nd of January. Five days later, the final reinforcements arrived in the form of the 37th ARVN Ranger Battalion, which was deployed more for political than tactical reasons. The Marines and ARVN dug in and hoped that the approaching Tet troops would provide some respite. On the afternoon of 29 January, however, the 3rd Marine Division notified K. San that the truce had been cancelled. The Tet Offensive was about to begin. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 3 Westmoreland's Plan to Use Nuclear Weapons Nine days before the Tet Offensive broke out, the Paven opened the Battle of Khe San and attacked the U.S. forces just south of the DMZ. Declassified documents show that in response, Westmoreland considered using nuclear weapons. In 1970, the Office of Air Force History published a then top-secret, but now declassified, 106-page report, titled The Air Force in Southeast Asia, Toward a Bombing Halt, 1968. Journalist Richard Ehrlich writes that according to the report, in late January, General Westmoreland had warned that if the situation near the DMZ and at Kaesan worsened drastically, nuclear or chemical weapons might have to be used. The report continues to state, this prompted Air Force Chief of Staff, General John McConnell, to press, although unsuccessfully, for JCS authority to request Pacific Command to prepare a plan for using low-yield nuclear weapons to prevent a catastrophic loss of the U.S. Marine base. Nevertheless, ultimately the nuclear option was discounted by military planners. A secret memorandum reported by U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, sent to U.S. President Lyndon B. Johnson on 19 February 1968, was declassified in 2005. It reveals that the nuclear option was discounted because of terrain considerations that were unique to South Vietnam, which would have reduced the effectiveness of tactical nuclear weapons. McNamara wrote, because of terrain and other conditions peculiar to our operations in South Vietnam, it is inconceivable that the use of nuclear weapons would be recommended there against either Viet Cong or North Vietnamese forces. McNamara's thinking may have also been affected by his aide David Morris Rowe, whose brother Michael Morris Rowe was serving at the base. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 4 Operation Niagara During January, the recently installed electronic sensors of Operation Muscle Shoals, 
which were undergoing test and evaluation in southeastern Laos, were alerted by a flurry of paven activity along the Ho Chi Minh Trail opposite the northwestern corner of South Vietnam. Due to the nature of these activities, and the threat that they posed to KSCB, Westmoreland ordered Operation Niagara I, an intense intelligence collection effort on paven activities in the vicinity of the Khe San Valley. Niagara I was completed during the third week of January, and the next phase, Niagara II, was launched on the 21st, the day of the first paven artillery barrage. The Marine Direct Air Support Center, located at KSCB, was responsible for the coordination of air strikes with artillery fire. An Airborne Battlefield Command and Control Center aboard a C-130 aircraft, directed incoming strike aircraft to forward air control spotter planes, which, in turn directed them to targets either located by themselves or radioed in by ground units. When weather conditions precluded FAC-directed strikes, the bombers were directed to their targets by either a Marine and slash TPQ-10 radar installation at KSCB or Y Air Force Combat Skyspot MSQ-77 stations. Thus began what was described by John Morocco as the most concentrated application of aerial firepower in the history of warfare. On an average day, 350 tactical fighter bombers, 60 B-52s, and 30 light observation or reconnaissance aircraft operated in the skies near the base. Westmoreland had already ordered the nascent Igloo White operation to assist in the Marine defense. On the 22nd of January, the first sensor drops took place, and by the end of the month, 316 acoustic and seismic sensors had been dropped in 44 strings. The sensors were implanted by a special naval squadron, Observation Squadron 67. The Marines at KSCB credited 40% of intelligence available to their Fire Support Coordination Center to the sensors. By the end of the battle, USAF assets had flown 9,691 tactical sorties and dropped 14,223 tons of bombs on targets within the Khe area. Marine Corps aviators had flown 7,098 missions and released 17,015 tons. Naval aircrews, many of whom were redirected from Operation Rolling Thunder Strikes against North Vietnam, flew 5,337 sorties and dropped 7,941 tons of ordnance in the area. Westmoreland later wrote, Washington so feared that some word of it might reach the press that I was told to desist, ironically answering what those consequences could be, a political disaster. Meanwhile, an inter-service political struggle took place in the headquarters at Fu by Combat Base, Saigon, and the Pentagon over who should control aviation assets, supporting the entire American effort in Southeast Asia. Westmoreland had given his deputy commander for air operations, Air Force General William W. Momia, the responsibility for coordinating all air assets during the operation to support KSCB. This caused problems for the Marine Command, which possessed its own aviation squadrons that operated under their own close air support doctrine. The Marines were extremely reluctant to relinquish authority over their aircraft to an Air Force General. The command and control arrangement then in place in Southeast Asia went against Air Force doctrine, which was predicated on the single air manager concept. One headquarters would allocate and coordinate all air assets, distributing them wherever they were considered most necessary, and then transferring them as the situation required. The Marines, whose aircraft and doctrine were integral to their operations, were under no such centralized control. On 18 January, Westmoreland passed his request for Air Force control up the chain of command to sink pack in Honolulu. Heated debate arose among Westmoreland, Commandant of the Marine Corps Leonard F. Chapman Jr., and Army Chief of Staff Harold K. Johnson. Johnson backed the Marine position due to his concern over protecting the Army's air assets from Air Force co-option. Westmoreland was so obsessed with the tactical situation, that he threatened to resign if his wishes were not obeyed. As a result, on 7 March, for the first time during the Vietnam War, air operations were placed under the control of a single manager. Westmoreland insisted for several months that the entire Tet Offensive was a diversion, including, famously, 
attacks on downtown Saigon and obsessively affirming that the true objective of the North Vietnamese was Khe San. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 5 Fall of Lang Ve The Tet Offensive was launched prematurely in some areas on 30 January. On the following night, a massive wave of paven slash bc attacks swept throughout South Vietnam, everywhere except Khe San. The launching of the largest enemy offensive thus far in the conflict, did not shift Westmoreland's focus away from Khe San. A press release prepared on the following day, at the height of Tet, showed that he was not about to be distracted. The enemy is attempting to confuse the issue, I suspect he is also trying to draw everyone's attention away from the greatest area of threat, the northern part of I Corps. Let me caution everyone not to be confused. Not much activity had occurred thus far during the battle for the special forces of Detachment A-101 and their four companies of Brucidges stationed at Lang Ve. Then, on the morning of 6 February, the Paven fired mortars into the Lang Ve compound, wounding eight Camp Strike Force soldiers. At 18.10 hours, the Paven followed up their morning mortar attack with an artillery strike from 152mm howitzers, firing 60 rounds into the camp. The strike wounded two more strike force soldiers and damaged two bunkers. The situation changed radically during the early morning hours of 7 February. The Americans had forewarning of Paven armor in the area from Laotian refugees from Camp BV-33. SOG reconnaissance teams also reported finding tank tracks in the area surrounding Koh Rock Mountain. Although the Pahaven was known to possess two armored regiments, it had not yet fielded an armored unit in South Vietnam, and besides, the Americans considered it impossible for them to get one down to Khe San without it being spotted by aerial reconnaissance. It still came as a shock to the Special Forces troopers at Lang Ve when 12 tanks attacked their camp. The Soviet built PT 76 amphibious tanks of the 203rd Armored Regiment churned over the defenses, backed up by an infantry assault by the 7th Battalion, 66th Regiment, and the 4th Battalion of the 24th Regiment, both elements of the 304th Division. The ground troops had been specially equipped for the attack with satchel charges, tear gas, and flame throwers. Although the camp's main defenses were overrun in only 13 minutes, the fighting lasted for several hours, during which the Special Forces men and Bruce Sidges managed to knock out at least five of the tanks. The Marines at Khe San had a plan in place for providing a ground relief force in just such a contingency, but Lones, fearing a paved ambush, refused to implement it. Lones also rejected a proposal to launch a helicopter extraction of the survivors. During a meeting at Da Nang at 7 o'clock the next morning, Westmoreland and Cushman accepted Lone's decision. Army Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Ladd, who had just flown in from Khe San, was reportedly, astounded that the Marines, who prided themselves on leaving no man behind, were willing to write off all of the Green Berets and simply ignore the fall of Lang Ve. Ladd and the commander of the SOG compound proposed that, if the Marines would provide the helicopters, the SOG reconnaissance men would go in themselves to pick up any survivors. The Marines continued to oppose the operation until Westmoreland actually had to issue an order to Cushman to allow the rescue operation to proceed. The relief effort was not launched until 1500 hours, and it was successful. Of the 500 siege troops at Lang Ve, 200 had been killed or were missing and 75 more were wounded. Of the 24 Americans at the camp, 10 had been killed and 11 wounded. Lones infuriated the Special Forces personnel even further when the indigenous survivors of Lang Ve, their families, civilian refugees from the area, and Laotian survivors from the camp at Ban Hoa Sen arrived at the gate of KSCB. Lones feared that Paven infiltrators were mixed up in the crowd of more than 6,000, and lacked sufficient resources to sustain them. Overnight, they were moved to a temporary position a short distance from the perimeter and from there, some of the Laotians were eventually evacuated, although the majority turned around and walked back down Route 9 toward Laos. The Lao troops were eventually flown back to their homeland, but not before the Laotian regional commander remarked that his army had to consider the South Vietnamese as enemy because of their conduct. 
The BRU were excluded from evacuation from the highlands by an order from the ARVNI Corps commander, who ruled that no BRU be allowed to move into the lowlands. Ladd, back on the scene, reported that the Marines stated, they couldn't trust any gooks in their dam camp. There had been a history of distrust between the Special Forces personnel and the Marines, and General Rathen M. Tompkins, commander of the 3rd Marine Division, described the Special Forces soldiers as hopped up, wretches, were a law unto themselves. At the end of January, Tompkins had ordered that no Marine patrols proceed more than 500 meters from the combat base. Regardless, the SOG reconnaissance teams kept patrolling, providing the only human intelligence available in the battle area. This, however, did not prevent the Marine tanks within the perimeter from training their guns on the SOG camp. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 6 Logistics and Supporting Fire Loans estimated that the logistical requirements of KSCB were 60 tons per day in mid-January and rose to 185 tons per day when all five battalions were in place. The greatest impediments to the delivery of supplies to the base were the closure of Route 9 and the winter monsoon weather. For most of the battle, low-lying clouds and fog enclosed the area from early morning until around noon, and poor visibility severely hampered aerial resupply. Making matters worse for the defenders, any aircraft that braved the weather and attempted to land was subject to pave an anti-aircraft fire on its way in for a landing. Once the aircraft touched down, it became the target of any number of paven artillery or mortar crews. The aircrew then had to contend with anti-aircraft fire on the way out. As a result, 65% of all supplies were delivered by paradrops delivered by C-130 aircraft, mostly by the USAF, whose crews had significantly more experience in airdrop tactics than marine air crews. The most dramatic supply delivery system used at Khe was the low-altitude parachute extraction system, in which palletized supplies were pulled out of the cargo bay of a low-flying transport aircraft by means of an attached parachute. The pallet slid to a halt on the airstrip, while the aircraft never had to actually land. The USAF delivered 14,356 tons of supplies to Khe by air. First Marine Aircraft Wing records claim that the unit delivered 4,661 tons of cargo into KSCB. The resupply of the numerous, isolated hill outposts was fraught with the same difficulties and dangers. The fire of Paven anti-aircraft units took its toll of helicopters that made the attempt. The Marines found a solution to the problem in the Super Gaggle concept. A group of 12A4 Skyhawk fighter bombers provided flak suppression for massed flights of 12 to 16 helicopters, which would resupply the hills simultaneously. The adoption of this concept at the end of February was the turning point in the resupply effort. After its adoption, Marine helicopters flew in 465 tons of supplies during February. When the weather later cleared in March, the amount was increased to 40 tons per day. As more infantry units had been assigned to defend KSCB, artillery reinforcement kept pace. By early January, the defenders could count on fire support from 46 artillery pieces of various calibers, five tanks armed with 90mm guns, and 92 single or on toes mounted 106mm recoilless rifles. The base could also depend on fire support from U.S. Army 175mm guns located at Camp Carroll, east of Khe San. Throughout the battle, Marine artillerymen fired 158,891 mixed rounds. In addition, over 100,000 tons of bombs were dropped until mid-April by aircraft of the USAF, U.S. Navy and Marines onto the area surrounding Khe San. This equates to roughly 1,300 tons of bombs dropped daily, 5 tons for every one of the 20,000 Paven soldiers initially estimated to have been committed to the fighting at Khe San. Marine analysis of Paven artillery fire estimated that the Paven gunners had fired 10,908 artillery and water rounds and rockets into Marine positions during the battle. Communications with military command outside of Khe San was maintained by a U.S. Army Signal Corps team 
the 544th Signal Detachment from the 337th Signal Company, 37th Signal Brigade in Da Nang. The latest microwave-slash-tropospheric scatter technology enabled them to maintain communications at all times. The site linked to another microwave-slash-tropo site inhumaned by the 513th Signal Detachment. From the HU site the communication signal was sent to Danang headquarters where it could be sent anywhere in the world. The microwave-slash-tropo site was located in an underground bunker next to the airstrip. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 7 Attacks Prior to Relief of the Base On the night of the fall of Langve, three companies of the Paven 101D Regiment moved in to jump off positions to attack Alpha 1, an outpost west of the combat base held by 66 men of Company A, 1st Platoon, 1 9th Marines. At 4.15 on 8 February under cover of fog and a mortar barrage, the Paven penetrated the perimeter, overrunning most of the position and pushing the remaining 30 defenders into the southwestern portion of the defenses. For some unknown reason, the Paven troops did not press their advantage and eliminate the pocket, instead throwing a steady stream of grenades at the Marines. At 7.40, a relief force from Company A, 2nd Platoon set out from the main base and attacked through the Paven, pushing them into supporting tank and artillery fire. By 11 o'clock, the battle was over, Company A had lost, 24 dead and 27 wounded, while 150 Paven bodies were found around the position, which was then abandoned. On 23 February, KSCB received its worst bombardment of the entire battle. During one eight-hour period, the base was rocked by 1,307 rounds, most of which came from 130mm and 152mm artillery pieces located in Laos. Casualties from the bombardment were 10 killed and 51 wounded. Two days later, U.S. troops detected Paven trenches running due north to within 25 meters of the base perimeter. The majority of these were around the southern and southeastern corners of the perimeter, and formed part of a system that would be developed throughout the end of February, and into March until they were ready to be used, to launch an attack, providing cover for troops to advance to jumping off points close to the perimeter. These tactics were reminiscent of those employed against the French at Dien Bien Phu in 1954, particularly in relation to entrenching tactics and artillery placement, and the realization assisted U.S. planners in their targeting decisions. Nevertheless, the same day that the trenches were detected, the 25th of February, 3rd Platoon from Bravo Company 1st Battalion, 26th Marines was ambushed on a short patrol outside the base's perimeter to test the paven strength. The Marines pursued three enemy scouts, who led them into an ambush. The platoon withdrew following a three-hour battle that left six Marines dead, 24 missing, and one taken prisoner. In late February, ground sensors detected the 66th Regiment, 304th Division preparing to mount an attack on the positions of the 37th ARVN Ranger Battalion on the eastern perimeter. On the night of the 28th of February, the combat base unleashed artillery and airstrikes on possible paven staging areas and routes of advance. At 21.30, the attack came on, but it was stifled by the small arms of the rangers, who were supported by thousands of artillery rounds and airstrikes. Two further attacks later in the morning were halted before the paven finally withdrew. The paven, however, were not through with the ARVN troops. Five more attacks against their sector were launched, during March. By mid-March, Marine intelligence began to note an exodus of Paven units from the Khe sector. The 325C Divisional Headquarters was the first to leave, followed by the 95C and 101D regiments, all of which relocated to the west. At the same time, the 304th Division withdrew to the southwest. That did not mean, however, that battle was over. On the 22nd of March, over 1,000 North Vietnamese rounds fell on the base, and once again, the ammunition dump was detonated. On the 30th of March, Bravo Company, 26th Marines, launched an attack toward the location of the ambush that had claimed so many of their comrades on the 25th of February. 
Following a rolling barrage fired by nine artillery batteries, the Marine attack advanced through two paven trench lines, but the Marines failed to locate the remains of the men of the ambushed patrol. The Marines claimed 115 paven killed, while their own casualties amounted to 10 dead, 100 wounded, and two missing. At 8 o'clock the following day, Operation Scotland was officially terminated. Operational control of the Khaesan area was handed over to the U.S. Army's 1st Air Cavalry Division for the duration of Operation Pegasus. Cumulative friendly casualties for Operation Scotland, which began on 1 November 1967, were 205 killed in action, 1,668 wounded, and 25 missing and presumed dead. These figures do not include casualties among Special Forces troops at Langvey, air crews killed or missing in the area, or Marine replacements killed or wounded while entering or exiting the base aboard aircraft. As far as pavement casualties were concerned, 1,602 bodies were counted, seven prisoners were taken, and two soldiers defected to Allied forces during the operation. American intelligence estimated that between 10,000 and 15,000 Paven troops were killed during the operation, equating to up to 90% of the attacking 17,200-man Paven force. The Paven acknowledged 2,500 men killed in action. They also reported 1,436 wounded before mid-March, of which 484 men returned to their units, while 396 were sent up the Ho Chi Minh Trail to hospitals in the north. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 8 President Johnson orders that the base be held at all costs. The fighting at Khe San was so volatile that the Joint Chiefs and MC commanders were uncertain that the base could be held by the Marines. In the US, the media following the battle drew comparisons with the 1954 Battle of Dien Bien Phu, which proved disastrous for the French. Nevertheless, according to Tom Johnson, President Johnson was determined that Khe San be an American Dien Bien Phu. He subsequently ordered the U.S. military to hold Khe San at all costs. As a result, B-52 arc light strikes originating in Guam, Okinawa, and Thailand bombed the jungles surrounding Khe San into stubble fields and Khe San became the major news headline coming out of Vietnam in late March 1968. Chapter 3 Section 2 – Relief and Retreat from Khe San Chapter 3 Section 2 Subsection 2 Operation Pegasus Planning for the overland relief of Khe San had begun as early as 25 January 1968, when Westmoreland ordered General John J. Tolson, Commander, 1st Cavalry Division, to prepare a contingency plan. Route 9, the only practical overland route from the east, was impassable due to its poor state of repair and the presence of Paven troops. Tolson was not happy with the assignment, since he believed that the best course of action, after Tet, was to use his division in an attack into the Aishau Valley. Westmoreland, however, was already planning ahead. Khaesan would be relieved and then used as the jump-off point for a hot pursuit of enemy forces into Laos. On the 2nd of March, Tolson laid out what became known as Operation Pegasus, the operational plan for what was to become the largest operation launched by 3 MAF thus far in the conflict. The 2nd Battalion, 1st Marine Regiment, and the 2 thirds Marines would launch a ground assault from Cielu Combat Base and head west on Route 9 while the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Brigades of the 1st Cavalry Division, would air assault key terrain features along Route 9 to establish fire support bases and cover the Marine advance. The advance would be supported by 102 pieces of artillery. The Marines would be accompanied by their 11th Engineer Battalion, which would repair the road as the advance moved forward. Later, the 1-1 Marines and 3rd ARVN Airborne Task Force would join the operation. Westmoreland's planned relief effort infuriated the Marines, who had not wanted to hold Khe San in the first place and who had been roundly criticized for not defending it well. The Marines had constantly argued that technically, Khe San had never been under siege, since it had never truly been isolated from resupply or reinforcement. 
Cushman was appalled by the implication of a rescue or breaking of the siege by outside forces. Regardless, on 1 April, Operation Pegasus began. Opposition from the North Vietnamese was light and the primary problem that hampered the advance was continual heavy morning cloud cover that slowed the pace of helicopter operations. As the relief force made progress, the Marines at Khe San moved out from their positions and began patrolling at greater distances from the base. Things heated up for the air cavalrymen on 6 April, when the 3rd Brigade encountered a paven-blocking force and fought a day-long engagement dot on the following day, the 2nd Brigade captured the old French fort near Khe San village after a three-day battle. The link-up between the relief force and the Marines at KCB took place at 8 o'clock on 8 April, when the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry Regiment entered the camp. The 11th Engineers proclaimed Route 9 open to traffic on the 11th of April. On that day, Tolson ordered his unit to immediately make preparations for Operation Delaware, an air assault into the Aishau Valley. At 8 o'clock on 15 April, Operation Pegasus was officially terminated. Total U.S. casualties during the operation were 92 killed, 667 wounded, and 5 missing. 33 ARVN troops were also killed and 187 were wounded. Because of the close proximity of the enemy and their high concentration, the massive B-52 bombings, tactical airstrikes, and vast use of artillery, Paven casualties were estimated by Mac as being between 10,000 and 15,000 men. Loans and the 26th Marines departed Khe leaving the defense of the base to the 1st Marine Regiment. He made his final appearance in the story of Khe San on 23 May, when his regimental sergeant major and he stood before President Johnson and were presented with a presidential unit citation on behalf of the 26th Marines. Chapter 3 Section 2 Subsection 3 Operation Scotland 2 On 15 April, the 3rd Marine Division resumed responsibility for KSCB, Operation Pegasus ended, and Operation Scotland 2 began with the Marines, seeking out the paven in the surrounding area. Operation Scotland 2 would continue until 28 February 1969 resulting in 435 Marines and 3,304 Paven killed. Author Peter Brush details that an additional 413 Marines were killed during Scotland 2 through the end of June 1968 inches. He goes on to state that a further 72 were killed as part Operation Scotland 2 throughout the remainder of the year but that these deaths are not included in the official U.S. casualty lists for the Battle of Khe San. Twenty-five USAF personnel who were killed are also not included. Chapter 3 Section 2 Subsection 4 Operation Charlie, Evacuation of the Base The evacuation of Khe San began on 19 June 1968 as Operation Charlie. Useful equipment was withdrawn or destroyed, and personnel were evacuated. A limited attack was made by a Paven company on 1 July, falling on a company from the 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines, who were holding a position 3 kilometers to the southeast of the base. Casualties were heavy among the attacking Paven, who lost over 200 killed, while the defending Marines lost two men. The official closure of the base came on 5 July after fighting, which had killed five more Marines. The withdrawal of the last Marines under the cover of darkness was hampered by the shelling of a bridge along Route 9, which had to be repaired before the withdrawal could be completed. Following the closure of the base, a small force of Marines remained around Hill 689 carrying out mopping up operations. Further fighting followed, resulting in the loss of another 11 Marines and 89 Paven soldiers before the Marines finally withdrew from the area on the 11th of July. According to Brush, it was the only occasion in which Americans abandoned a major combat base due to enemy pressure and in the aftermath, the North Vietnamese began a strong propaganda campaign, seeking to exploit the U.S. withdrawal and to promote the message that the withdrawal had not been by choice. The Paven claim that they began attacking the withdrawing Americans on 26 June 1968 prolonging the withdrawal killing 1,300 Americans and shooting down 34 aircraft before liberating Khe San on 15 July. 
The Paven claim that during the entire battle they eliminated 17,000 enemy troops, including 13,000 Americans and destroyed 480 aircraft. Regardless, the Paven had gained control of a strategically important area, and its lines of communication extended further into South Vietnam. Once the news of the closure of KSCB was announced, the American media immediately raised questions about the reasoning behind its abandonment. They asked what had changed in six months so that American commanders were willing to abandon Khe San in July. The explanations given out by the Saigon command were that the enemy had changed his tactics and reduced his forces, that Paven had carved out new infiltration routes, that the Marines now had enough troops and helicopters to carry out mobile operations, that a fixed base was no longer necessary. While KSCB was abandoned, the Marines continued to patrol the Khe San Plateau, including reoccupying the area with ARVN forces from 5 the 19th of October 1968 with minimal opposition. On the 31st of December 1968, the 3rd Reconnaissance Battalion was landed west of Khe San to commence Operation Dawson River West. On the 2nd of January 1969 the 9th Marines and 2nd ARVN Regiment were also deployed on the plateau supported by the newly established fire support bases Geiger and Smith, the three-week operation found no significant Paven forces or supplies in the Khe San area. From 12 June to 6 July 1969, Task Force Guadalcanal comprising 1 9th Marines, 1st Battalion, 5th Infantry Regiment and 2nd and 3rd Battalions, 2nd ARVN Regiment occupied the Khe San area in Operation Utah Mesa. The Marines occupied Hill 950 overlooking the Khe San Plateau from 1966 until September 1969 when control was handed to the Army who used the position as a SOG operations and support base until it was overrun by the Paven in June 1971. The gradual withdrawal of U.S. forces began during 1969 and the adoption of Vietnamization meant that, by 1969, although limited tactical offensives abounded, U.S. military participation in the war would soon be relegated to a defensive stance. According to military historian Ronald Spector, to reasonably record the fighting at Khe San as an American victory is impossible. With the abandonment of the base, according to Thomas Ricks, Khe San became etched in the minds of many Americans as a symbol of the pointless sacrifice and muddled tactics that permeated a doomed U.S. war effort in Vietnam. Correspondent Michael Hare reported on the battle, and his account would inspire the surreal Du Long Bridge scene in the film Apocalypse Now, which emphasized the anarchy of the war. Chapter 4, Aftermath Chapter 4 Section 1, Termination of the McNamara Line Commencing in 1966, the U.S. had attempted to establish a barrier system across the DMZ to prevent infiltration by North Vietnamese troops. Known as the McNamara Line, it was initially codenamed Project 9 before it was renamed Die Marker by McVin September 1967. That occurred just as the Paven began the first phase of their offensive by launching attacks against Marine-held positions across the DMZ. The attacks hindered the advancement of the McNamara line, and as the fighting around Khe San intensified, vital equipment including sensors and other hardware had to be diverted from elsewhere to meet the needs of the U.S. garrison at Khe San. Construction on the line was ultimately abandoned and resources were later diverted towards implementing a more mobile strategy. Chapter 4 Section 2 Assessment the precise nature of Hanoi's strategic goal at Khe San is regarded as one of the most intriguing unanswered questions of the Vietnam War. According to Gordon Rockman, even the North Vietnamese official history, Victory in Vietnam, is largely silent on the issue. The question, known among American historians as the Riddle of Khe San, has been summed up by John Prados and Ray Stubber. Either the Tet Offensive was a diversion intended to facilitate Paven slash VC preparations for a war winning battle at Khe San, or Khe San was a diversion to mesmerize Westmoreland in the days before Tet. In assessing North Vietnamese intentions, Peter Brush cites the claim of Vietnamese theater commander, Vo Win Zop, that Khe San itself was not of importance, but only a diversion to draw U.S. forces away from the populated areas of South Vietnam. 
that has led other observers to conclude that the siege served a wider paven strategy by diverting 30,000 U.S. troops away from the cities that were the main targets of the Tet Offensive. Whether the paven actually planned to capture Khaesan or the battle was an attempt to replicate the Viet Minh triumph against the French at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu has long been a point of contention. Westmoreland believed that the latter was the case, and his belief was the basis for his desire to stage Dien Bien Phu in reverse. Those who agree with Westmoreland reason that no other explanation exists for Hanoi to commit so many forces to the area instead of deploying them for the Tet Offensive. The fact that the North Vietnamese committed only about half of their available forces to the offensive, most of whom were Viet Cong, is cited in favor of Westmoreland's argument. Other theories argued that the forces around Khe San were simply a localized defensive measure in the DMZ area or that they were serving as a reserve in case of an offensive American end run in the mode of the American invasion at Incheon during the Korean War. However, North Vietnamese sources claim that the Americans did not win a victory at Khe San but were forced to retreat to avoid destruction. The Paven claimed that Khe San was a stinging defeat from both the military and political points of view. Westmoreland was replaced two months after the end of the battle, and his successor explained the retreat in different ways. General Creighton Abrams also suggested that the North Vietnamese may have been planning to emulate Dien Bien Phu. He believed that was proved by the Paven's actions during Tet. He cited the fact that it would have taken longer to dislodge the North Vietnamese at Hue if the Paven had committed the three divisions at Khe San to the battle there instead of dividing its forces. However, the Paven committed three regiments to the fighting from the Khe San sector. Another interpretation was that the North Vietnamese were planning to work both ends against the middle, a strategy that has come to be known as the option play. The Paven would try to take Khe San, but if could not, it would occupy the attention of as many American and South Vietnamese forces in I Corps as it could, which would facilitate the Tet Offensive. This view was supported by a captured North Vietnamese study of the battle in 1964 that stated that the Paven would have taken Khe San if it could have done so, but there was a limit to the price that it would pay. Its main objectives were to inflict casualties on U.S. troops and to isolate them in the remote border regions. Another theory is that the actions around Khe San and the other battles at the border were simply faint sans ruse meant to focus American attention and forces on the border. A historian, General Dave Palmer, accepted that rationale, General Zop never had any intention of capturing Khe San, was a feint, a diversionary effort. And it had accomplished its purpose magnificently. Marine General Ravan M. Tompkins, the commander of the 3rd Marine Division, pointed out that had the Paven actually intended to take Khe San, Paven troops could have cut the base's sole source of water, a stream 500 meters outside the perimeter of the base. If only it had contaminated the stream, the airlift would not have provided enough water to the Marines. Also, Marine Lieutenant General Victor Krulak seconded the notion that there was never a serious intention to take the base by arguing that neither the water supply nor the telephone landlines were ever cut by the Paven. One argument that was then leveled by Westmoreland and has since often quoted by historians of the battle is that only two marine regiments were tied down at Khe San, compared with the several Paven divisions. When Hanoi made the decision to move in around the base, Khe San was held by only one or two American battalions. Whether the destruction of one battalion could have been the goal of two to four Paven divisions was debatable. However, even if Westmoreland believed his statement, his argument never moved on to the next logical level. By the end of January 1968, he had moved half of all U.S. combat troops, nearly 50 maneuver battalions, to I Corps. Chapter 4 Section 3, Used During Operation Lam Sun 719 On 30 January 1971, the ARVN and U.S. forces launched Operation Dewey Canyon II, which involved the reopening of Route 9, securing the Khe San area, and reoccupying of KSCB as a forward supply base for Operation Lam Sun 719. On 8 February 1971, 
the leading ARVN units marched along Route 9 into southern Laos while the U.S. ground forces and advisors were prohibited from entering Laos. American logistical, aerial, and artillery support was provided to the operation. After the ARVN defeat in Laos, the newly reopened KSC came under attack by Paven sappers and artillery and the base was abandoned once again on 6 April 1971. Chapter 5 Sources Unpublished Government Documents U.S. Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, Command History 1965, Annex N. Saigon, 1966. U.S. Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, Command History 1966, Annex M. Saigon, 1967. Published Government Documents. Hey, Win Jui. Operation Lam Sun 719. Washington, D.C., United States Army Center of Military History. OCLC 227,845,251. Military History Institute of Vietnam. Victory in Vietnam, A History of the People's Army of Vietnam, 1954-1975. Trans? Pribinau, Merle. Lawrence Kays, University of Kansas Press. ISBN 0706-1175-4. Nolte, Bernard C. Air Power and the Fight for K. San. Washington, D.C., Office of Air Force History. Archived from the original on 10 April 2003. Retrieved the 22nd of May 2021. LCCDS 557.8.K5N34 1986. Pearson, Willard. The War in the Northern Provinces 1966-1968. Vietnam Studies. Washington, D.C., Department of the Army. ISBN 978-0-1609-20936. Sure, Moyers S. 3. The Battle of Khe San. Washington, D.C., U.S. Marine Corps Historical Branch. OCLC 923,350,777. Shulimsin, Jack, Blaisol, Leonard, Smith, Charles R., Dawson, David. The U.S. Marines in Vietnam, 1968, the Decisive Year. Washington, D.C., History and Museums Division, United States Marine Corps. ISBN 0160491258. Telfer, Gary L., Rogers, Lane, Fleming v. Keith. U.S. Marines in Vietnam, 1967, Fighting the North Vietnamese. Washington, D.C., History and Museums Division, United States Marine Corps. LCCDS 558.4. U55-1977. Van Staveren, Jacob. Interdiction in Southern Laos, 1961-1968. Washington, D.C., Center of Air Force History. LCCDS 558.8. V36-1993 Autobiographies Westmoreland, William C. A Soldier Reports New York, Doubleday ISBN 0385-004346. Secondary Sources Ankeny, Robert C. Lerps, A Ranger's Diary of Tet, Kaysan, A Shao, and Quang Tri. Landham, M.D., Roman and Littlefield Publishing Group. ISBN 978-0-76184-373-3. Boston Publishing Company. The American Experience in Vietnam, Reflections on an Era. Voyageur Press. ISBN 978-0-76034-623. Clark, Bruce B. G. Expendable Warriors, The Battle of Khe San and the Vietnam War. Westport, Connecticut and London, 
Prager International Security. ISBN 978-0-275-99488. Donaldson, Gary. America at War Since 1945, Politics and Diplomacy in Korea, Vietnam, and the Gulf War. Westport, Connecticut, Greenwood Publishing Group. ISBN 978-0-27595-668. Doherty, Martin J. 100 Battles, Decisive Battles That Shaped the World. Bath, Paragon? ISBN 978-144546-763-4. Duggan, Clark, Vice, Stephen, et al. 1968. Boston, Boston Publishing Company. ISBN 0939526069. Eggleston, Michael A. Dactu and the Border Battles of Vietnam, 1967-1968. McFarland. ISBN 978-147666-469. Johnson, Tom A. To the Limit, an Air Caf Huey Pilot in Vietnam. Dulles, Virginia, Potomac Books. ISBN 978-159797-446-2. Jones, Greg. Last Stand at Khe San, the U.S. Marines' Finest Hour in Vietnam. Cambridge, Massachusetts, the Capo Press. ISBN 978-0-306-82139-4. Kelly, Michael P. Where We Were in Vietnam. Hellgate Press. ISBN 155571-625-3. Krulak, Victor. First, to Fight, An Inside View of the U.S. Marine Corps. Annapolis, Maryland, Naval Institute Press. ISBN 978-161251-161-0. Long, Austin. The Soul of Armies, Counterinsurgency Doctrine, and Military Culture in the U.S. and U.K. London, Cornell University Press. ISBN 978-150173-19. Long, Lolly. Unlikely Warriors, The Army Security Agency's Secret War in Vietnam 1961-1973. iUniverse. ISBN 978-14759-9059-1. Maitland, Terence, McKinnery, John. A Contagion of War. Boston, Boston Publishing Company. ISBN 0939526050. Morocco, John. Thunder from Above, Air War, 1941-1968. Boston, Boston Publishing Company. ISBN 0939526093. Murphy, Edward F. The Hill Fights the First Battle of Khe New York, Ballantine Books. ISBN 978-129910-828-8. Murphy, Edward F. Semper Fi, Vietnam, From Da Nang to the DMZ, Marine Corps Campaigns, 1965-1975. Random House. ISBN 978-0-30741-661-2. Nolan, Keith William. Into Laos, The Story of Dewey Canyon 2 Slash Lam Sun 719. Novato CA, Presidio Press. ISBN 978-089141-247-2. Page, Tim, Pimlot. John. Nam, The Vietnam Experience. New York, Mallard Press. 
ISBN 978-079245-0030. Palmer, Dave Richard. Summons of the Trumpet, The History of the Vietnam War from a Military Man's Viewpoint. New York, Ballantine. ISBN 978-034531-583-0. Pike, Thomas F. Military Records, February 1968, 3rd Marine Division, The Tet Offensive. ISBN 978-14812-1946-4. Pike, Thomas F. Operations and Intelligence, I Corps Reporting, February 1969. ISBN 978-15194-8631. Pike, Thomas F. I Corps Vietnam, An Aerial Retrospective. ISBN 978-1366-28725. Pisa, Robert. The End of the Line, The Siege of Khaesan. New York, Norton. ISBN 978-0-34531-0927. Plaster, John L. Sog, The Secret Wars of America's Commandos in Vietnam. New York, New American Library. ISBN 0-451-23118-X. Prados, John, Stuber, Ray. Valley of Decision, The Siege of Khaesan. Annapolis, Maryland, Naval Institute Press. ISBN 0395-55033. Rotman, Gordon L. Khaesan 1967-68, Marines Battle for Vietnam's Vital Hilltop Base. Oxford, Osprey Publishing. ISBN 978-184176-863-2. Rotman, Gordon L. Viet Cong and NVA Tunnels and Fortifications of the Vietnam War. Oxford, Osprey Publishing. ISBN 184603-003-X. Ryan, Raphael. The Siege of Khaesan. Military History. 2, 74-81. Sigler, David Burns. Vietnam Battle Chronology, U.S. Army and Marine Corps Combat Operations, 1965-1973. Jefferson, North Carolina, McFarland and Company. ISBN 0-7864-1764. Smith, Charles. U.S. Marines in Vietnam, High Mobility and Stand Down 1969. History and Museums Division, Headquarters, U.S. Marine Corps. ISBN 978-14942-8762-7. Stanton, Shelby L. Green Berets at War, U.S. Army Special Forces in Southeast Asia, 1956-1975. Novato, California, Presidio Press. ISBN 978-089141-238-0. Stanton, Shelby L. The Rise and Fall of an American Army, U.S. Ground Forces in Vietnam, 1965-1973. New York, Dell. ISBN 0-89141-232-8. Tucker, Spencer, ed. A Global Chronology of Conflict, From the Ancient World to the Modern Middle East. Volume 6, 1950-2008. Santa Barbara, California, ABC Clio. OCLC 838055731. Tucker, Spencer, ed. Encyclopedia of the Vietnam War, A Political, Social, and Military History. Volume 1. Santa Barbara, California, ABC Clio. ISBN 0874369835.
Warren, James. The Mystery of K. San. In Robert Cowley. The Cold War, A Military History. New York, Random House. ISBN 978-0-30748-372. Welburn, Chris. Vietnam Sieges, Dean Bian Phu and K. San, Any Comparison. Australian Defence Force Journal, 51-63. ISSN 1320-2545. Wilbanks, James H. The Tet Offensive, A Concise History. Columbia University Press. ISBN 978-0-231-12841-4. Wirtz, James J. The Tet Offensive, Intelligence Failure in War. Cornell University Press. ISBN 978-150171-335-4.